So I've been thinking a lot about the country that we're living in, the state of the United States of America, and two stories in particular really got to me. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about a lot of things in this video because they're important to hammer out so we can all get on the same page and move forward in this great nation that we call the United States of America. However, I do have a sponsor for today's video. It's Keto with Justice. We're going to run into the ad and then we're going to talk about it on the other side. A new study just revealed some shocking statistics. According to the CDC, 49% of the American population is medically obese, not overweight, not slightly too big for those pants, obese. And it's because people are just kind of being a little bit more active and kind of watching their diet. But what they really need is a secret weapon. And the secret weapon that I recommend is Keto with Justice. Go to my custom URL, ketowithjustice.com, order yourself a product at a 51% discount just for people in my audience that is proven to assist people in losing weight. It follows the basic principles of the keto diet it's got great reviews. If you don't love it, you can return it within 60 days and get a money back guarantee. No risk, high rewards. Go to ketowithjustice.com to get that. The two stories that really got under my skin the past couple of days were the Columbus story, which happens every single year, where people talk about how Columbus Day needs to be renamed Indigenous Peoples Day. And of course, that Superman, according to DC Comics, no longer stands for truth, justice, and the American way. Now it's truth, justice, and a better tomorrow. Something very globalisty, something not American, because as we know, just as is true in the whole Columbus versus Indigenous Peoples Day, we need to shed, according to our overlords, all love for our country and our great nation and appreciation for the civilization that we live in. And we're going to run into the Columbus Day thing first because this happens every year and I always forget when Columbus Day is so I never time the video accurately for when it comes out, but it's incredibly important. Let's be clear about something. Christopher Columbus is one of the most important figures in world history, period, point blank. And the reason why he's one of the most important figures in world history is because he discovered, let me make that clear, discovered the Americas. Now, some dorks, nerds, losers, anti-American scumbags will tell you that Christopher Columbus didn't really discover the Americas because there were people living here. Yes, there were people living in the Americas, North and South America. We all understand that. We all get that. We all have the concept of that in our brain. But the people that lived in North and South America didn't know of the existence of the other peoples of the world. And the peoples in Europe, Asia, and Africa didn't know of the existence of the peoples in the United States of America. And as Neil deGrasse Tyson, of all people, put it, Christopher Columbus's move united two halves of the human tribe that were separated for thousands of years. Okay, I think him coming to America was the most significant thing to ever happen in our species. The, our ancestors who come out of Africa, go into Europe, some stayed, others kept wandering. Some stayed low above the Mediterranean, others went high. They populate Asia. They keep walking because there's a land bridge there. They don't even know it's a bridge, it's just more land. So they walk and they enter North America. And from there, that's kind of the only way you can go is south at that point. The weather gets a little better. The Ice Age ends. The glaciers melt back into the oceans. The oceans level, ocean levels rise, closing the land bridge, stranding a branch of the human species for 10,000 years. Now you have Europe, Asia, Africa, and North and South America, and they know nothing of one another. Two separate branches of the human species. The Vikings notwithstanding, maybe they found, came over, they didn't, I, I'm, they, even if they did, their influence was near zero relative to the Europeans. So we're talking about influence here. This is a branch. Had this continued, this is how you speciate. This is why the species on Australia, that's why you have mammals there that have pouches. All right, no other mammals do that. They s split off and they evolve their own way. Okay, so 10,000 years is not enough to grow three heads or, you know, 12 fingers, but our species is separate. Now, Columbus crosses the Atlantic, makes contact with humans. This is the first time that has happened in 10,000 years. We have rejoined 
two branches of the human species. This accomplishment is unparalleled in world history. There is a reason why our capital, the District of Columbia, is named for Christopher Columbus. There's a reason why Columbia is a character in American folklore that represents expansion of the American civilization. The Statue of Liberty is quite literally the female depiction of Christopher Columbus. So in this respect, regressive leftist, Christopher Columbus, the first gender neutral explorer, the first trans explorer, and you should love him. Now, it's not debatable whether or not this was an amazing accomplishment. It is not debatable whether or not this fundamentally improved world history. And we could talk about judging Columbus's morals at the time governing an unknown land in comparison to our morals today, but that's really not productive. It doesn't get us anywhere, and it doesn't change history. And one of the things that I can't stand about this Indigenous People's Day push is is that, sure, we can recognize indigenous tribes. That's totally fine. But give them their own day in their own month. It doesn't have to be on Columbus Day and make the holiday about attacking Christopher Columbus. Because what you're attacking when you're attacking Christopher Columbus is the idea of Western civilization. And they don't even try to hide this. So Indigenous People's Day is not Indigenous People's Day. Indigenous People's Day is anti-Columbus Day. It is anti-Western Day. It is also, fundamentally, if you want to racialize it, an anti-white people day. That's what the day is all about. And sorry, hate to break it to the natives out there, but if a Native American cured cancer tomorrow, then their accomplishment would still pale in comparison to Christopher Columbus discovering a new continent, two new continents, and uniting the Western world with the Eastern world. It's just uncomparable, undeniable. Fundamentally, you cannot touch it in any way, shape, or form, so stop trying. But what this is really about is... It's trying to get us to hate ourselves. It's trying to get us to lose the will to defend Western civilization. It's trying to flatten everything out in world history and say that we're no better than any other peoples. Our culture is no better than any other cultures. Our right to live, survive, thrive into the future is no more earned than any other cultures when it's just not the case. This is why people talk about the genocide of Columbus, the genocide of Columbus. There is no genocide of Christopher Columbus. What happened when European settlers came to the Western world is that they had diseases that they didn't know about, they didn't know the origin of, and the natives didn't have immunity to those diseases. So 90% of the natives were wiped out completely by accident. On top of that, it's not like the natives didn't give anything back to the European settlers that they ultimately didn't take back to Europe. Millions of people in Europe died from syphilis. That came from the New World. First cases of it ever reported, 1495. Columbus landed in the Americas in 1492. It should not be hard for us to figure out and date where this disease came back from. The natives are not responsible for giving syphilis to the settlers. The settlers are not responsible in a moral way. Obviously, we know the origin point for giving diseases to the natives. And I find it incredibly hypocritical, incredibly shameful, incredibly disgusting that we are currently in a global pandemic right now that was either created due to the irresponsibility of the Chinese or due to maybe, and I'm just throwing this out there as a slim possibility because it doesn't look like the virus was designed, due to the criminal evil intent of the Chinese communists, but anytime you bring up the origin point of the virus, all of a sudden that's considered racist, that's considered not cool, that's considered not progressive. We can't assign responsibility for what we're currently facing under now when people understand germ theory, people understand the risk of experimenting with viruses, but we have to take all the responsibility for something an Italian explorer on a mission from Spain did in 1492. It's absolutely absurd, it is shameful and disgusting, and it's meant to humiliate us and meant to not acknowledge the accomplishments of this man. So yeah, was Columbus a perfect guy by today's standards? If you heard about what he did and what he did was yesterday, would you praise him? Probably not. But then again, he is the man who had the vision, who sailed the ocean blue, and discovered two continents uniting the human tribe. Unparalleled accomplishment. Nobody can touch it. And anybody who tries to touch it, shame it, whatever, 
They're doing so out of weakness and trying to make you feel guilty for the existence of the civilization that you live under. The new world was going to be discovered at some point by somebody, and I'm damn glad that it was by the Europeans and not by the Chinese or by the Japanese, or by any other group of people that would have acted quite similarly to the Europeans and brought the same amount of diseases. That's just the way the world works. That's how the cookie crumbles. Whatever way you need to understand that I am not at all guilty about the Columbus thing, and none of you should be, that's the way it is. Oh, and if you want to talk about the Vikings having a settlement in Nova Scotia and then leaving after a couple of years, again, we're talking about the impact on world history. The Vikings probably didn't even know they were on a new continent, and they didn't take note of it, they didn't write it down, and it didn't alter the course of world history in the same way that Columbus did. Just not comparable. Also, the idea that the natives were these noble, peaceful people, it's just not true. Some tribes are more peaceful than other tribes, but a lot of them were violent. They had their own emperors. And there's a reason why conquistadors were aided by local populations that were being oppressed by the emperors or the god kings, whatever you want to call them, when they arrived. Now, let's talk about Superman, the man of steel, the man of tomorrow, the last son of Krypton. The man that is supposed to stand for the truth, justice, and the American way that all of a sudden, according to DC Comics, no longer stands for that. All of a sudden, Superman is all about the world, and I understand that he's a world hero and he wants to defend the planet. I understand that this is a fictional universe, etc. But you guys know, if you watch my 40-minute video on Superman, that I care about this character. And the reason, partially, that I care about this character is because fundamentally, he is tied to Americana. Yes, he was invented by immigrants. Lots of things that are truly American came from immigrants. Yes, he has a long and sordid history, and the truth, justice, and the American way thing comes from the 1950s version of Superman, so it wasn't fundamentally attached to the character at inception. However, it does matter. It does show where we're going as a nation, because instead of being proud of the country that we live in, instead of feeling honored by the country that we live in, instead of acknowledging that we are standing on the shoulders of giants that build this country, we're now looking at the giant and checking if they're smelling our feet. We're now ashamed of the nation that we live in. We don't have the will to defend it. So we're allowing fundamental totems of our nation to be altered and changed just so they can satisfy the new orthodoxy. And it's shameful and disgusting. Superman, as I told you a million times, his Kryptonian origins don't matter. That gives him his powers, whatever. It's not a big deal. But the best Superman stories are reflective of this fundamental idea that the Kents are the real heroes. Jonathan and Martha Kent from Smallville, Kansas, Middle America as you can be, they raised this demigod powered level alien into being the hero that we all recognize. The best stories of Superman, a lot of them are alternate universe stories where what if he landed and he was taken by government operatives instead of a salt to the earth family in the state of Kansas. Superman Red Sun is all about what Superman would be like if he landed in the Soviet Union, which turned over to the government, and how fundamentally corrupt he would be growing up in that system. Superman is good because the American people are good. Superman is noble because the farmer in the middle of Kansas in this country, the family farmer, is noble. Superman has values because the American people have values. So the idea that he doesn't stand up for the American way anymore is a rejection fundamentally of the character in principle and design. Now, why does this matter? Why am I talking about this? Why am I bringing this up? It's because it does matter. It's important because what we're experiencing in this nation is called moral paralysis, and it's impacted other nations before with devastating consequences. If we don't fundamentally buy into something as Americans, if we don't believe that our civilization is moral, if we don't believe that we have a right to defend our interests around the world, if we don't believe that we have a moral obligation to defend our values across the world and everything's equal— this will lead to greater conflict further into the future, and we're seeing the results of it right now with the rise of China. The United States should fundamentally be able to disassemble the Chinese Communist Party. We should be able to stand up to them on the moral stage. However, we keep getting bogged down in how our history is somehow shameful, our history is somehow regrettable. 
our history is nothing that gives us a moral right to lecture anybody in the world, which is objectively nonsensical. The United States is a special nation in the history of the world. We're the first nation to enshrine religious freedom in our Constitution. We're the first nation to enshrine patent protections in our Constitution. So we fundamentally believe that you can practice and believe what you want, and we fundamentally believe that you are the author of your own destiny. If you invent something, you own it. And this has allowed this nation to become the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. But yet we're being lectured to or we're trying to listen to people that are morally equating us to the Chinese communist regime. Have you read Mao's Great Famine? It's an excellent book and you need to get on that if you haven't read it. This book details the horrors of the Chinese Communist Party from its inception. The idea that the United States has anything to apologize for in comparison to these people, the idea that we would hesitate for a second to assert moral superiority over these people is absolutely shameful when you acknowledge the actual history of this nation versus any of these other nations. Let's be clear about something. The United States did in fact have slavery, but you know what? We inherited slavery. We did not invent slavery. We are unique in in that we fought a war to abolish slavery, not unique in the way that we instituted slavery. The same is true for most of the Western world. The British Empire abolished slavery not only in their own country, but in all their territories, and then tried to stop it in other places around the world. There are nations that still have slavery in this world. They're not Western nations. They're not nations built on our ideals, and their slavery is not an outgrowth of something that we set up sometime in the past that we're now responsible for. That's not how that works. The United States is one of the least racist countries in the world. I know a lot of people get that twisted. They get it backwards. But we're in a nation where we expect equality for minorities, where we expect equality for women, where we expect equality under the law for all manner of differentiating sexualities. That is not the truth in the rest of the world. And all these nations that try to flex on us about how we're so racist, we're so evil, we're so bad, and when it comes to this regard, don't even have significantly minority populations in their nation. Or if they do, they have way worse fundamental culture clashes in their country. The Chinese are currently rounding up the Uyghur Muslims as we speak due to the fact that they have the wrong religion, they're wrong ethnically. Whatever justification they're using, it's happening right now. And we're going to talk about how the United States had some issues in the past when it comes to this regard. We're going to talk about how the United States, because we had a significant minority population and we worked through the problems of having that minority population in conflict with the majority population and somehow we're beneath any of these other nations is patently absurd and we should reject the subversive notions on their face. There's a reason the Chinese Communist Party is funding all this intersectionality nonsense in this country. When they produce propaganda to divide and break the American spirit, this is what they go to because this is fundamentally anti-American propaganda. Back at home in China, they're embracing the Chinese identity. They're embracing their nation. They're embracing their perceived right to rule all of the Chinese territories that were formerly not a part of the Chinese communist system. Now, the idea of moral paralysis is not something that we should think about in the abstract sense. It's not something that is for academics, that has no real-world implications. It has had impact on world events. And I'm going to give you a perfect example in the nation of France, their World War II performance versus their World War I performance. In World War I, the French resisted German occupation and invasion for four strong years. They lost more people in that war than Americans have died in all of our wars combined in the history of this country, but they held the line and they fought bravely. They won many victories. They glorified the French after they won these victories because they understood that fundamentally allowing the Germans to run roughshod over their civilization was not moral. They believed France was worth fighting for, which is why they fought so hard. But in World War II, and for all the years after, the French gained a reputation for surrender. And that's because in World War II, they surrendered in six weeks. How did this happen? How did a once mighty people, just a generation before, known for resistance, fighting tooth and nail to the last man, not wanting to be ruled by anybody, let alone their German neighbors, within a generation become cowards, become a punchline, surrender to the Nazi government in six weeks? What went wrong here? 
And fundamentally, it was because the French became war weary. It's because the French didn't think France was worth defending. They thought that the illusion of peace was more palatable than actually facing the war. They thought they could pacify the warlike intentions by downplaying the heroism of the French in the previous generation. Teachers who were obsessed with peace demanded that the textbooks that kids were getting remove all mention of the French soldiers as heroes. Instead, they were portrayed as victims, or if there was any talk of heroism, it was talking about heroism on both sides, the World War I Germans and the heroes on the side of the French. It was never something where the French were asserting that they were a morally superior force to the Germanic peoples. They just gave up. They surrendered. They surrendered in their minds before they surrendered on the battlefield. It was all in the name of peace, but in reality, converting the French state religion to worshipping on the altar of peace did nothing to prevent the most destructive war in human history. However, if the French were bolstered up, if they believed in the French identity, if they believed in their right to protect their interests, they could have ended World War II before it even started. In 1936, in violation of two separate treaties... Hitler and Germany sent troops into the Rhineland. This was, again, in violation of two treaties. At this point, the French were armed to the teeth. They outmatched the German army in every conceivable way. The Nazi soldiers were actually given orders to retreat because they knew if the French marched in to assert and enforce these treaties, then they would be done for because they did not have the strength, but they were testing the will of the French people, and the French people failed in that test. They did not defend the Rhineland. They did not stop the Nazis before they became a problem. And again, this led to the most destructive war in human history, all due to the fact that the French lost their will to fight. They lost their patriotism. They were morally paralyzed after the losses of World War I, not realizing that that moral paralysis would lead to more devastating losses and consequences in the Second Great War. Now, a lot of you are going to assert that the Americans are not the French, that the American people are more hopeful, optimistic people. But in reality, are we that fundamentally different from French society? If the Chinese Communist Party decided that they were going to take Taiwan tomorrow, do you think that the United States would galvanize behind the Taiwanese cause? Do you think that the people in this nation would believe that we had a fundamental moral obligation and more importantly, moral authority to intervene on behalf of Taiwan and put the CCP in its place? Because I don't. We have a war-weary population. We have a population that thinks we need to cut ourselves off from the world and just enjoy ourselves within our own country because the problems overseas will not affect us in the future. It's just not true. This is what the French believed, and what ended up happening was we saw a war with greater consequences than we've ever seen before. And if we back down to China repeatedly right now, we are setting ourselves up for a third great war that will be even more devastating than the two previous. The truth is we're a country where a significant portion of our population has a broken will. We've allowed subversive elements in our nation to take down the American spirit. Now, Americans don't have that fundamental identity, so much so that even people on the right wing don't even recall it. At least Australians have something of an identity, right? Like maybe that identity is a little bit gay right now, but it's still like an identity. What do I have in America that I can identify with? Yeah. I know yeah. that that's like, yeah. I, I get I get what you're saying and I get where you're coming from and I don't mean to obviously tell you how to feel about anything, but I would say that America does still have an identity. It's just not found What is it though? Is it something that we would be proud of? It's because hard, I don't think so. It's hard to articulate to you as a, as a foreigner. <laughs> it's 40 ounce Baja no, blasts and AR-15s. <laughs> And, it's more than and that. by the way, it's come disrespect than... our laws and cross our borders, and we'll just let you in. It's, it's fine. Yeah, don't it's... And then, by Texas. the way, after you come in, you can harass a sitting senator. It's more than this superficial stuff. It's more than the guns, and it's more than the Baja blast. I want to agree with you so badly. <laughs> Tell but me what it is. I'm trying to find a way of articulating it. Other foreigners, perhaps who live here, might might be able to comment on this too and tell you guys because there is something still about the United States that I still go. I am so bloody glad to live here. And it's not something that I can necessarily put my finger on or succinctly summarize because it's just this feeling that you get when but you, you think, live in Texas. But when no, yeah. no, but I had it. Uh, well, I didn't really have it in D.C. But when I went out to Virginia 
and even in Maryland, which are both shit. But I, when I would go there, I'd go, I still get it, right? It's the American flag hanging out front of someone's yard. But what do those flags say, represent? Hello. When they fly them and you ask them, what are you proud of? I'm proud to be an American because we're free. Really? They don't have freedom in Canada? They don't have freedom no. in... No, well... The American identity has always been that of hope, of the adventure, the idea that you can risk it all and make it here. Because if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. That's who we fundamentally are. That's the reason why the Hollywood ending is a thing. Because Americans are optimists fundamentally. And Hollywood reflected those values back on the nation. We're not like European dramas or European shows. Seriously, watch them and understand the difference. They're far more pessimistic than us. They're far more dour. Even their sitcoms tend to end on a joke that downplays the main character, whilst our sitcoms tend to rise up and boost up the main character. Because fundamentally, Americans believe that they control their own destiny and that the future, tomorrow, is brighter than today. But we're losing that. We're losing our great nation. I mean, we have people within our own nation that are embracing the destruction of our nation. How many people have you heard on the right and the left get on board with this idea of a national divorce? That is nothing more than sowing the seeds for a future war within our own borders. And if you don't believe me, then please submit to me a map on paper of the continental United States that you can draw, dividing it into two countries that won't lead to future conflict. Spoiler! Spoiler alert, I will be detailed looking into the way that you're dividing up the Mississippi River because New Orleans, the port of New Orleans, is a fundamentally left-wing city and it is one of the most important strategically as it's the mouth of the Mississippi River our nation is going to have and we're going to have a bunch of right-wing or middle ground states on this border of this new nation that you're going to want to draw and fundamentally since that's going to be the ocean access for a huge portion of the majority of the country since we're dividing it from the coastal elites and the middle bit of the country i need to know how strategically you're going to draw this border without destroying our nation without plunging us into a future civil war we should not destroy ourselves. We should not embrace this idea of national divorce. And we should stop talking about this nation as if we're the last of a mighty people, as if our nation's best days are behind us. Look, if we don't turn the tide now, then we will, in fact, be history. We will be talking about this nation as if we were the last generation of a mighty people. But the thing is, is that what we have to acknowledge is that our history is great. Our civilization is worth fighting for. We are not immoral monsters like the Nazi government. We are the nation that went out and defeated the Nazis. We are not the Imperial Japanese who wreaked havoc over the continent of Asia. We're the people who defeated the Imperial Japanese. And then we built these nations up into free and prosperous societies. We fought the greatest army in the history of the world that was a part of the greatest empire in the history of the world for our liberty and we won we're not the nation that invented slavery we're the nation that fought a war to abolish it and we won that is fundamentally who we are but those are just our past achievements we also have future achievements to look forward to we outlasted the soviet union and we will outlast and endure the communist chinese as long as we have the will to outlast and endure the communist chinese you need to make a choice on an individual level about what kind of person you are and more broadly we need to make a choice as a people about what type of people are going to comprise this nation are we going to be a people who embrace and and celebrate one of the greatest accomplishments in exploration in the history of the world? Or are we going to be a people that are too afraid to have our own symbols of heroism reflect our values? But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you like the video, you show me by leaving a like. You can subscribe for more content. Follow me on all my social media. Support me via the support links in the description box. Follow me on the new Instagram. Till next time.